everyone. Thank you everybody for joining us. We are excited to see everybody here. I'm Kate Frankfurt. I'm the Chief Philanthropy Officer of the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation. And on behalf of our CEO, Stacy Caldwell, who is also here Hello. with us. Hi, Stacy. Um, and our uh, board members, Kristen York, uh, and staff members, Nicole Lichtenmuller, Sashay Cantu, um, I think Carolyn Croffy is here as well. We really welcome you um, and want to thank you all for joining our Forest Futures Salon, Weather Impacts on Wildfire Risk and Recovery. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to recognize everybody who is here. Thank you all for taking the time to come this afternoon. I think we have a really great discussion ahead of us. As we all know, this past fire season was one of the worst on record lasting longer than ever before with mega fires surrounding our Tahoe Truckee community. And the behavior of these fires was different than we expected. Jumping terrain we had thought would serve as a break. The idea that fire has a season is also now something that I think is in question with the Colorado fire in Big Sur, the Marshall fire between Boulder and Denver, and most recently the airport fire near Bishop causing evacuations in the winter months. I think wildfire, it is safe to say, is now a year-round threat here in the West. Our community, however, is nothing if not resilient, and we are not ones to sit back and wait. Forest Futures, TTCF's newest initiative, is our response to climate action and to the immediate threat that our community faces from wildfire in the region. It was born after four years of deep learning alongside some of the foremost experts in the field. Forest Futures is a bold and entrepreneurial and strategic model for how community foundations can take a lead role in confronting the local impacts of climate change. There are three areas of impact. Protect communities, which is reducing fuels, establishing fire breaks, making sure key evacuation routes are clear and supporting the development and use of technology to keep us informed. The second, build a forest economy, is funding for workforce development, infrastructure and industry to utilize hazardous forest waste while strengthening the economy in our region. And finally, accelerate market solutions, scaling and speeding forest management while creating a model that can be replicated in other global mountain communities. It's a strategy that's built on a long-standing relationships, one built from the ground up rather than from the top down. And we're deploying flexible and nimble capital to fill needs and gaps, accelerating projects, permits, and progress with funds flowing into the community almost as quickly as we can raise them. TTCF has been here before. Our nearly 25 year history has positioned us well as a trusted leader with our ear to the ground and with an innovative and collaborative approach to addressing our community's greatest needs. Our housing work is now being replicated in other mountain communities ranging from South Lake to Telluride and our emergency response fund model established during COVID has informed the structure of Forest Futures flexible and nimble trust-based philanthropy. We still have much to learn as a community. And these Wildfire 101 salons are a great place to start. And as they say, knowledge is power. So with that, I want to turn this over to uh, and introduce Nicole Lutkemuller, who will be our moderator for the evening. She's our program director for Forest Futures, and she will also lead tonight's Q&A. Nicole. Thanks, Kate. And thanks everyone for joining us today and especially to our two speakers tonight. We have Dr. Ann Nolan and Dr. Neil LaRue joining us to speak on um, the weather impacts both to wildfire risk and recovery efforts. And um, we're very excited for you to have your share your expertise and your research on this topic. Um, we know that declining precipitation and snowpack patterns can increase wildfire risk but uh, we're also excited to learn from you both on how it affects fire behavior and post-fire restoration and reforestation efforts. So with that, um, I'll give a brief introduction to both of our speakers tonight, and then we'll jump right into their presentations. Just a piece of housekeeping. Um, you can put questions in the chat while our, our presenters are talking, but we ask that you put them in the chat and then we'll address them kind of based on 
Um, if it's a topic or a question that would be helpful to address during the presentation, we'll, we'll allow that opportunity. Otherwise, if it's something that can kind of wait until they've both gotten through their presentations, we'll do a more open question and answer session at the end. But we encourage you to type in your questions to the chat as they come to your mind so you don't have to write them down or remember them during the presentations. So with that, so we have Dr. Ann Nolan, and Ann is a hydrologist and mountain geographer with over three decades of experience in snow hydrology, climatology, and remote sensing. She's a professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Nevada, Reno, and serves as the director of the Graduate Program of Hydrologic Sciences. She's drilled ice cores in Greenland, measured snow across the western U.S. and Alaska, and used satellite observations to monitor changes in glaciers, sea ice, ice sheets, and snowpacks globally. She and her students use field measurements, airborne and satellite remote sensing, and computer, computer simulations to understand how forest management, wildfire, and climate change are impacting our mountain snowpack. And after Anne's presentation, we'll have Dr. Neil LaRoe's presentation. And Dr. LaRoe's research program leverages modern observing and modeling systems to advance our understanding of atmospheric dynamics across a range of scales. His research focuses on high impact weather in the Western United States, and he is the assistant professor in the Department of Physics at UNR. His research foci include fire, weather, and wildfire plume dynamics, complex terrain boundary layers, cumulus convection, orographic precipitation, and synoptic scale weather systems. Dr. LaRoe joined UNR in 2018, and pre previous appointments include faculty at San Jose State, postdoctoral scholar at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and postdoctor scholar at San Jose State University. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Ann Nolan to get us started first. All right, thanks. I just wanna start by thanking Kate and Nicole for organizing this and for inviting me. I'm really glad to be here. And I also hope to learn a little bit more about, from you about the challenges that are facing your region and um, how perhaps some of my expertise and background can help. So let me share my screen and we'll get started. Okay. So I'll start by telling you that I have eight slides and I am going to tell you the story first on the first slide. Oops, sorry. Um, okay, the story has five parts, but then they link back to each other. So, um, the story is also based on data, uh, although I can talk more about models and future forests and future snowpacks. But today I'm gonna to be specifically talking about data that we've collected from stations, snow tell sites, which are snowpack telemetry sites that monitor snowpack and climate variables uh, for several decades and remote sensing data from satellites. So, these are not climate model output that I'll be talking about, it's data. So the story is we have warmer winters that are causing earlier snowmelt across the Western United States, mainly the mountains. And this, these warmer winters causing earlier snowmelt, less snow altogether, snow droughts that we, we ex are experiencing. Uh, this winter is a really good example of that. We've had a few big storms, but in general, we've had conditions that I would classify as a snow drought. Uh, if we don't get more snow, if we don't have a miracle march, we will have an earlier snow melt. And in general, that earlier snow melt means less water for forests and moisture stressed forests because there's a longer dry season and our forests run out of water usually by kind of August, September. These moisture distressed forests become more vulnerable to fire and to pest infestations as well, which also can contribute uh, fuel to fires. But these moisture stress forests are sort of more dried out. Uh, you have um, kind of dead or dying or just moisture stress trees in general um, over big swaths. And so they, we can have fires such as we've had in the last couple of years, which have been two really remarkable back-to-back -back years of a lot of big fires in the California Sierra Nevada and elsewhere across the West. So then after the fire, snow matters and is impacted by the fire, post-fire conditions itself. So up to as many as 15 years after a, a severe forest fire, 
you can have black carbon being shed onto the surface of the snowpack each winter um, from the charred timber that remains with the remnants of the forest, of the burned forest. And that dark stuff on the snow creates darker snow, which absorbs more solar radiation, which melts at weeks earlier. So again, you have a shorter snow season after a fire. And then this cascading impact, this looping back is important because Again, snow matters after a fire and before a fire. Um, and that after fire, if it's being melted out earlier, the, the revegetation, the post-fire revegetation itself depends on winter snowfall. Because we live in a, 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 an environment, in, um, an eco region, uh, where the, uh, much of the, of the water for trees uh, healthy forest comes from snowmelt. And so anything that's affecting the snowmelt affects the forest. And then anything that affects the forest is going to ultimately affect the snowmelt as well. So that's the story. So I'm going to lead you through each of these steps in the next few slides. And I really look forward to some of your questions. I hope it's clear by the end, um, but I also hope that it piques your interest to ask some more questions. So um, some of the work that my students and I have done indicates that from these snow tell sites, which are, uh, which are operated by the Natural Resources Conservation Service, which is a, uh, 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 a branch of the federal government, they monitor snowpack. There's uh, about, eight, uh, about a thousand sites really across the West. And any place on the, on the left-hand plot, you can see that map where you see blue dots that's showing where you have a, a positive trend in, um, I should say, where you have uh, fewer snowstorms in November. It's drier, more dry days in November. So this is kind of interesting because I think anecdotally, those of us who spend a lot of time in the mountains and thinking about skiing or snowboarding, um, we kind of know, like, you know, if we've been around for a while and I have, it's gotten drier. I, you know, we all like, oh, I remember as a kid, as a teenager, as a young adult, we used to have snowy Novembers. We used to all go skiing as a family or whatever, doing something involving snow around Thanksgiving. Well, now we don't have as many snowy days. So there has been this positive trend towards dry days in November. So it's, it's positive, but it's like, it's a negative impact in the sense of it's like, you know, if you love snow like I do, it's it's not a it's not a fun trend. It's it's a trend that we're not really excited about. So we have fewer snowy days in November, more dry days. But what does that mean? It means we have a longer dry season. It means that dry season, which used to be just sort of oh through you know through September and October, you know the sometime in October the rains and snows would come, and now it's not until more like December. Uh, and so our fire season is a lot longer. That dry season not only is affecting the health of the forest and our ability to recreate in the snow and our hydrology, but it also affects um, the fire season as well. The other part of this is that during the min middle of winter, throughout the rest of the time, November, December, January, February, March, um, those winter temperatures are warmer. So everywhere on the right-hand map, where you see a red blob there, that's showing one of those snow tell sites that has a positive trend. And the size of the colored dots indicates the magnitude of the trend. And in this case, you can say it's, uh, you know, most of these are on the order of uh, one to two degrees Celsius per decade. And this is, you know, over 34 years that we were looking. So. It's, it's a significant increase in winter temperatures. So Novembers are drier and the rest of the winter is warmer. And that leads to less snow overall and earlier um, disappearance of snow. And so snow's gone earlier and it doesn't come back until later. So that's our dry season. From satellite data, one of the effects of this is that we see across the Sierra Nevada is that we see this trend toward either greening or browning that has a spatial variability to it. And so the, anything that's colored sort of brown or tan 
means those trees in September. The, and this is just forest. This is not um, this is not sagebrush. This is just forests in the Sierra Nevada mountain eco region. And so anywhere that you see brown, that means that those forests are getting um, more moisture stressed. We're measuring this using satellite data from one of the NASA instruments called MODIS. And we're using a pigment-based index that measures um, the photosynthetic activity of evergreen forests. And so if it's uh, getting greener, and interestingly, some places are getting greener, and most of those are because of uh, vegetation growing back after a fire. But in general, most of the west side of the Sierras and the lower elevations of the Sierras and, and of, that, of the west side um, are getting browner, are more moisture stressed. And this is September. So this is like the driest, you know, those trees have really gotten kind of crispy that by that time of year. And interestingly, we see also this trend in snow disappearance date. And this is for the same period, same satellite. And if you are, if you're looking at sort of, uh, sort of yellow to tan to brown colors, I'm sorry, the trend in days doesn't really match up with the colors as well as I had hoped. Um, but we see a decrease on the order of days to even as much as, uh, in some cases, 10 days over that 30-year um, period. And so we see a shorter snow season. And one of the things that's really interesting is that the moisture stress, this vulnerability of forests, is very closely correlated with the snow disappearance state. Um, another a metric that we can use is snow cover frequency. And that's the number of times over the course of an entire winter, actually the course of an entire water year, that we might see snow in one of these satellite remote sensing pixels, uh, one of these grid cells. And the trends are almost uniformly negative. We see that snow cover is there less often. And usually less often means less snow. Um, and so these are the kinds of things that we can measure from satellite, the moisture stress, this, this um, measure of moisture stress from satellites, the snow disappearance date and the snow cover frequency. And we've got a long enough record from satellite that, that goes from 2000 to 2021 um, that we can actually say something significant about the trends. Now, I wanna point out the red outline down here. This is a place where my students and I have been focusing on, it's the Creek Fire. So I'm. We haven't really jumped full bore into the Caldor fire. That's something we're just starting, but we've been spending a lot more time um, analyzing data from, the, from this Creek fire, which is the headwaters of the upper San Joaquin River Basin, which is one of the main suppliers of water to California's Central Valley. Um, about 40, a little over 40% of the basin, upper San Joaquin River Basin burned during the Creek fire. And of that burned area, about 11% of it was high burn severity, which doesn't seem like very much, but it's more than double what normally, if we can think of like a normal fire, um, what a normal fire might look like uh, for high burn severity. So um, we see specific to this creek fire that there's this greening and browning trend in this area. There's surprisingly no relationship between summer rainfall and the trends that we see here. It's really, it all has to do with snow. And so you can see in this plot at the bottom here called a histogram, it just says, okay, if, if we're looking at how many times uh, we see greening versus browning, um, most of the values fall on the, on the browning side of that dividing line, that orange dividing line. And the same thing for snow that, um, we see an earlier snow disappearance date in this region and throughout the entire Sierra Nevada. In fact, I can predict, I can explain 50%, a little over 50% of the variability of moisture stress of this greening versus browning by just, if I, I can just tell you what that moisture stress is, um, I can explain 50% of that variability just by telling you what the snow disappearance date is and nothing else. It's really pretty strong relationship. So 
after a fire, uh, and this is this is part of the creek fire I'm showing you. So you can see the really charred remnants of the trees. Uh, this was a fairly dense part of a second growth forest. In fact, most of our forests here in the Sierras are second growth. Um, so we might have a lot of mix of ladder fuels and, and um, some older trees. But uh, in, a, in some of these high burn severity areas, the canopy is completely burned off and you end up with black carbon shed onto the surface of the snowpack, like in the picture here. And that lowers the reflectivity of the snow. It's albedo is what we call that term. Um, and the canopy's gone. It's no longer really shading the snow. Um, and so you have loads of sunlight, solar energy coming in and hitting that darker snowpack and melting it off days to weeks earlier. Again, shorter snow season after fire. And then that can affect the revegetation after fire. This is in the Columbia River Basin. This is approximately, um, let's see, this was 15 years after the B&B &B complex fire on a south facing slope and trees did not really grow back, only shrubs. And so we can generate these novel ecosystems in some cases because we just don't have the same climate what, uh, now as we had when those trees were, when that forest was originally established. So there's this really interesting interplay that I'm arguing tells this story of cascading impacts between snow before a fire mattering to the health of the, of the forest. Then if that forest is vulnerable to fire and a fire occurs, that fire might be more severe. And after that fire, you're going to have these more immediate effects on the snowpack itself. It might be declining. Uh, because of that combination of um, the post-fire effects on albedo and canopy, but also the continued effects of climate warming um, that creates these snow droughts, whether it's a warm snow drought or a dry snow drought. Um, yeah, and then after the fire, that, that vegetation regrowth might be remarkably slow and you might not even get a forest back. So that's slide number eight. And again, the take home message is snow matters to forests, fire affects snow, as does climate, and snow affects the regrowth of the forest. So I will stop sharing there and hand it over to Neil unless there's some immediate uh, questions that people have. Thanks. Thanks so much, Anne. Um, that was very interesting data that you shared with us on that topic. Uh, at the moment, we don't have any questions from the audience. I have some for you, but I will hold off on those until after we hear from Neil and um, connect the dots on some of these research issues. So Neil, if you would like to share your screen and take it away. Sure, <clears throat> just a second, hopefully I'll select the right thing here. Uh, of course it says I'm sharing, I can't see anything, but I'll assume that it I, is. Can I am seeing it, so. Okay, yeah. great. I, hopefully everyone else is. If you're not, send me a chat. <laughs> All right, well, first of all, um, as, as Anne said, thanks for uh, the invitation to talk to the group today. And thanks, Anne, for that uh, great, great talk. And, um, you know, I, I think I'm going to kind of pick up where um, from the, the fuels and what happens in the atmosphere and how that feeds back on the fire. And so oftentimes um, I kind of get grouped into being like a fire weather uh, expert, but really I, I like to think about it as kind of the weather driven by the fire is a lot of what I do and the, the vicious feedback or positive feedback cycle that happens um, between the kind of external weather that's making a fire uh, particularly bad and how that fire might go on to generate its own weather that then feeds back on the winds um, and the intensity of the fire. And really the, the underlying thing here is that Western US wildfires are, are increasingly producing extreme weather, uh, which leads to these feedbacks in fire intensity and rate of spread. And this really is a vicious cycle that makes it very difficult to contain these fires uh, and leads to severe fire impacts, uh, such as some of the, the burn impacts, uh, for example, in Anne's photos there of the you know, um, kind of open canopy over, over the snow in, in the creek fire. And what am I talking about when I'm talking about extreme uh, weather generated by fires? Well, generally kind of three things here. Uh, one would be fire generated thunderstorms and the, the fancy term that we use for that that I'll use a lot 
today are pyrocumulonimbus or pyro CB for short, which just means a fire generated thunderstorm. Uh, also fire generated tornadoes, which uh, until recently were considered an extremely rare phenomena, but are now something that we're at least uh, in, in the last few years seeing quite a few of in the Western United States, as well as uh, extreme long range spotting from these fires, casting embers on the order of five miles away from the fire front leading to rapid progression of fires through the landscape, which of course uh, makes it extremely difficult to contain the fires. And when we think about fires like the Dixie fire and the Caldor fire, um, you know, the, we know these impacts, you know, firsthand from seeing it in our, in our backyard, unfortunately. And of course the common denominator for all of this, it's not a mistake that fires are getting um, bigger and, and more intense um, and leading to these extremes of fire generated weather. The common denominator is, of course, the fuels, which I like to think of as an integrator of climate change, of climate impacts, um, including, for example, the browning uh, that, that Anne was discussing uh, nicely. It's actually, that's a, a nice jumping off point to just look at some of the extremes of fire generated weather that we can get. In fact, the, the Creek Fire is uh, probably one of the more profound examples of, of fire generated extreme weather. Uh, the 5th of September in 2020 was the day of the kind of most uh, intense fire run on the Creek Fire. Of course, it went to went on to burn for much, much longer than that. But this day in particular produced um, extreme fire generated thunderstorms with cloud tops, uh, such as shown in the top right, as well as in this uh, animation here, which is reconstructed from weather radar observations of, of the fire, those plume tops reached up to about 55,000 feet in altitude, which is um, quite a bit higher even than we fly our commercial aircraft. And so there's pilot photographs looking out their windows at um, the, this cloud towering above them. And this uh, fire generated thunderstorm produced a tremendous amount of lightning as well as downdrafts and downbursts back into the fire. And as some of uh, the research that we've recently published showed, produced uh, fire generated tornadic vortices, which is a fancy way of saying uh, full fledged fire tornadoes uh, for upwards of nine hours uh, during the evolution of the fire as it marched out of the upper San Joaquin River uh, drainage near um, Mammoth Pool Reservoir up into the, the adjacent topography. So really just kind of a, a profound example of, of that from, from the Creek Fire. And of course, Fast forward a year and we, we saw similar things um, early in the growth of the, the Dixie fire. So the video on the left that uh, is hopefully showing here is a time lapse of some of the alert fire cameras uh, showing the explosive growth of one of these fire generated thunderstorms as it rockets up, uh, in this case, up to about 32,000 feet in altitude. So looks quite impressive here, but actually kind of amazing to think about how much bigger the Creek fire uh, plume was at this point. But the Dixie Fire was, was remarkable in that it produced weather or fire generated weather like this for the better part of a month, um, burning nearly a million acres and producing multiple episodes of these deep fire generated thunderstorms, uh, two of which are shown in the, the radar animations there to the right, both early in its, its evolution and then much later in its evolution after it had burned across the Sierra Crest. Um, you know, all the way up to Lake Almanor and Chester uh, and eventually all the way over to US 395 and Susanville uh, and becoming one of the, you know, the first well-documented fires to have crossed the, the Sierra Crest. And of course we had a, another one um, uh, just, just days later with, with the Caldor fire. And one of the remarkable things about, about this was these fire generated thunderstorms really um, marked these big blow up days, uh, loss of containment on the fire, pushing the fire into new terrain and uh, allowing the fire to grow to such, such remarkable size. They also facilitated long range spotting um, in some instances uh, up to five miles off of the fire front, igniting new fires outside of the containment lines and uh, kind of leading to this continual uh, interplay between efforts to contain the fire and putting down miles and miles of dozer lines and containment efforts only to have embers fly across those lines and uh, kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, make short work of, of all that human and, and financial effort. And of course, some of the, the impacts were, were, you know, devastation to, to towns in, in the Northern Sierra. 
So one of the things that we've learned from looking at these, and this is kind of a complicated diagram, so I'm not going to go through it in too much detail, but we've been able to identify now that at least three of the major fires that we've had in the, the last um, three or four years, the, the Loyalton fire, which was um, here, here near Loyalton uh, and just north of Reno, the Creek fire, uh, as well as the Bear fire, which burned down to Lake Oroville, all produce these um, long-lived fire-generated tornadic vortices. So we're talking about winds upwards of 100 miles an hour, um, very strong rotation, destruction to trees, and um, casting of embers and all sorts of impacts on, on the fire evolution. And when we go in and kind of look at the, the structure of all of these fires, they're actually quite similar, which is interesting because it allows us to start at least building conceptual and somewhat physical models for uh, what sort of conditions allow for fires to, to generate these, um, these sorts of phenomena. And some of the common things that we see can actually be related to, uh, if you think about just a, a rock in a river and the kind of impacts that it has on the, the water flow which is kind of analogous to the airflow around wildfires. So uh, in each of these fires that have produced um, these, the updraft of the fire kind of acts like a rock blocking some of the stronger southwesterly winds that are often driving our fires, splitting the airflow around the edges of the fire and creating large eddies on either flank of the fires, as well as this area shown, for example, in the red arrow here of water or air flowing backward toward the fire or the rock in this case. And between those two eddies rotating in different directions. And what we see is that when the fire kind of um, feeds back on one of these eddies in particular, it can, can give rise to these tornadic vortices, um, which, which again can be quite destructive in their own right, and really feed back or become the dominant driver of the fire once, once they form. And certainly once we're at this point in a fire, um, it's more of a get out of the way uh, than something that we can really, really do anything about. So it's a really, really critical transition in the fire when it starts generating these, these sorts of flows. So that's a kind of, you know, again, something that we're seeing more of, which is, which is disturbing. Um, and with the Caldor fire, for example, we saw it on its first day of explosive growth on the, the 17th of August, it got very close to producing these sorts of phenomena. Um, the top is a radar animation. The bottom is a, a time lapse. And it's a little bit dark and, and hard to see, but there's an airflow wrapping in and underneath as well as a spiraling of the airflow aloft. And it's this case, it tried very hard to produce some of these big vortices. It never quite got there, which I, was, was a good thing, um, but it certainly kind of fed back still on, on the fire behavior in this, in this case. The other thing that we see with these fires, once again, is that long range spotting. Um, this is the casting of embers through these really deep plume structures that are generated. Um, and a good example of that on, on the Caldor fire was when it crossed Echo Summit and came down and cast embers uh, right across Myers uh, and jumped Highway 89 and then you know continued to progress uh, to the east toward, toward Nevada. And we're able to use some of our research tools to look at the, the structure of these plumes. And, you can quite literally in here see where the embers are going up and then where they're falling back to the surface. And uh, if you look at some of the infrared mapping of, of the fire shown here on the bottom, there's the, the gap here uh, where there was active fire suppression, but uh, the casting of embers across here and then thus the, the fire keeps running. Uh, so again, a, a manifestation of how these fire generated winds and plume dynamics can, uh, can lead to extreme, extreme outcomes. And I'll just conclude uh, by saying that, that this kind of spotting process leads to extremely rapid fire progression in some cases. We saw this both during the campfire, which is shown here in a radar animation, uh, as well as during the bear fire. I think this one might animate as well. Nope, didn't, doesn't animate, oh well. Um, but we see the same sort of plume structures where there's an updraft and then an ember fallout region. And those embers where they're falling out are leading to the, the rapid advance of, of the fire and uh, lead, leading to things that we really can't contain, especially with the receptiveness of these very dry fuel beds. Uh, and so we're working on developing tools to kind of track and predict some of these processes in real time. But obviously it's a, it's a difficult situation and one 
we prefer not not to be in uh, at, at you know one, once you're at this point there's, there's very little that can be done uh, with these fires. So um, just kind of to, to wrap up, um, you know what what we're looking at and what my research is, is looking at are these extremes of fire generated weather and how they, they feed back on explosive and extreme fire behavior uh, leading to these um, these fires that are very difficult to contain and unfortunately have profound impacts on, on our communities. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over and looking forward to the discussion from here. Thanks so much, Neil. Those models are super interesting and just really cool to see um, the type of modeling that's happening on these fires and hopefully um, some interesting data and lessons learned that will help us figure out how to manage these situations better in the future. Um, we have gotten a couple questions in and they're both actually somewhat related to each other and kind of directed at you. So I'm gonna kind of combine them and ask them to you to get us started. But Dan Christian asked if there's a critical wind speed above which the fire tornadoes become more likely. And Anne also asked if there's a critical force density needed to create conditions for extreme fire weather. So asking both about wind speed and forest density and how they influence the, this fire behavior. Yeah, those great questions. Um, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, the, the long answer is probably, um, roughly speaking, we, we kind of have this metric that when the intensity of the fire's updrafts um, become equal to or stronger than the background wind that's driving the fire, um, so the wind that you might just feel standing out on your deck, uh, that that oftentimes represents kind of a critical transition in the fire from a what might conventionally be called a wind-driven fire to a, a plume-dominated fire. And in reality, it's, it is much more complicated than that. But so oftentimes, um, and, and there's a lot of vacillation or kind of moving back and forth between those regimes, but oftentimes we might see something like a, a 30 mile an hour wind uh, impacting the, the spread of the fire on these explosive fire days. Um, and getting 30 mile an hour updrafts from a fire is actually pretty easy. Um, <laughs> we've measured updrafts of 130 miles an hour in, um, these massive plumes and uh, so really more of what I see is actually kind of a critical size which is it tends to be when the fire is roughly 10 kilometers in, in width um, that it can disrupt the airflow sufficiently to generate these these sorts of things so when I look at the creek the bear the loyal 10 fires they all have kind of fire line widths of uh, somewhere between five and ten kilometers when they start producing these phenomena and then the, the forest density thing, I mean, the fuels are, of course, the driver. Um, and uh, and so ha having sufficient fuel is, is absolutely, um, you know, the only way to get enough heat to produce big enough updraft to block the flow and modify the flow like this. But I'm not sure that I could put a, a number on that just yet. Good question, man. I'll, I'll, we'll have to talk about that one. Great, thanks so much, Neil. Um, I'm gonna go to just a question that I kind of had that I think is probably burning on most people's minds is um, with the modeling that you're both able to do and your, your knowledge in this area, do you have predictions that you could share for the upcoming fire season based on the you know amount of snowpack and precipitation that we've gotten so far? And then kind of you know following up on that, I guess to you, Neil, is there is it possible that, you know, if we get more rain in the spring or the summer, does that help quiet things down? Or is it really the snowpack that we need in the winter? And, and what are we looking at for this upcoming season? And that sounds like a great question for you. Okay. <laughs> right. So first off, um, summer rain, good, except we don't really get summer rain. And if we do, it's usually accompanied by lightning strikes, which are um, major ignition um, sources for fires. So some of our fire complexes are ignited by um, lightning clusters. So not that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, snow is the good thing. And right now I read, I heard this morning we're at 63% of average, which is, kind of bad and you know it doesn't look like it's getting a whole lot better but you know it can change but once we start getting into April um, we're really not going to get any extra snow 
it just doesn't happen. We are in a so-called Mediterranean climate. And, uh, you know, most of our precipitation falls in sort of the December, January, February timeframe. And we've had a uh, remarkably dry January, February. You know, we had six weeks of essentially no precipitation and, and now record warm temperatures. And um, so I anticipate that we will likely have an earlier snow disappearance date that can likely lead to um, a higher vulnerability for our forests and uh, higher potential for fires. Um, looking into the distant or not so distant future from our climate models, what those show us is that by mid-century, that is, let's say uh, 2050, 2060, um, most of our winters, when, when we use this metric called the frequency of warm winters, which uh, we defined as uh, a winter in which any of the core winter months, December, January, February, have an average temperature at or above the melting point, you know, zero Celsius or 32 Fahrenheit. And so it, it, that's the monthly mean temperature, right? So if any one of those three months has an average temperature at or above that melting point, we call that a warm winter. If we look at the frequency of warm winters, obviously it depends a lot by elevation, um, but what we see is that almost 100% of the winters in this region become warm, well over 90% by mid-century under the current trajectory of climate change. So there was a recent paper by um, Erica Woodburn et al. that showed, talked about um, the future of low and no snow winters. And so our model output shows something similar which is really depressing. Hopefully um, we can slow that down with some of the efforts that are being undertaken right now. Yeah, the there's a couple of things and I, I don't wanna dominate the conversation other than I do wanna make one point. We can increase snow pack. If, if we have snowfall, we can increase the accumulation of snow on the ground and the retention of that snow. If we are judicious about um, managing forests by thinning them in certain ways on south versus north facing slopes. Um, snow tends to accumulate in the canopy and then because winds are higher and there's more sunlight right up above the canopy that snow gets undergoes sublimation gets kind of, you know, vaporized back into the atmosphere. So if there's less canopy and that snow is, can fall into the gaps and then is shaded in the spring, then yeah, I mean, we can accumulate more snow and retain it, but that all, that assumes that we get the snow in the first place. Right, yeah. Right? So there's so, kind of like two big pieces to the puzzle that oh, need yeah. to occur together if we want to mm -hmm. impact the, the current trajectory. That is correct. And, yeah. and I will also state that um, it's not a smooth trajectory. We have a lot of ups and downs and, mm -hmm. Weir weather winter weather weirding is kind of so yes there is a trend in the mean but there's also a trend in the variance if you're yeah. thinking about the statistics things are getting weird yeah thanks neil do you want to add on to that one yeah i i would definitely you know i don't making predictions about fire seasons are definitely tricky but i you know one thing that scares me with the early loss of snow and certainly that we saw last year is um, moving the on switch to fire season earlier um, gives us much longer days for fires to burn. Um, you know, I feel like just anecdotally in the past, a, a lot of our big fires, the on switches are around the beginning of August and days are already shortening, you know, then, but by, by quite a bit. And when we get earlier fire seasons, um, you know, our long days in July, when like when we think about the Dixie, um, the Dixie fire and fires that we saw in Oregon last year, like the bootleg fire that were actually quite early in the season for fires of that size. Um, and, you know, they have multiple hours more daylight to work with um, before we get that natural break. Uh, and we've also seen a lot of really active nocturnal fire behavior um, kind of going along with this. 
too. Um, so yeah, it scares me to see these early snow loss dates. Um, and, you know, just looking out my window right now, it's uh, amazing how quickly it's going. So I'm, uh, it, I, it, I feel like every season right now, we've been kind of in a contest with Australia, kind of like hold my beer, who's going to have the worst fire season ever on, on record. So hopefully we somehow break out of that trend, but I'm not particularly optimistic. Great, thank you too for answering that one. I'm gonna go to a question that's kind of a combination from um, Sashe uh, and another one that was that Anne actually kind of posed and about the the modeling that you both are doing um, and for this effort. And just Sashe asked um, or was curious to hear more about what you're developing in terms of new modeling or how this data that you shared with us is integrated into other modeling and then how um, academia which you both are um, academics in the research side of things are partnering and information sharing with um, public agent entities and land management agencies to utilize some of this data that you're creating. Um, I can I can go first quickly on that. Um, we're we're trying to take weather radar observations, which are the models that I was kind of showing you. Then it's not really a model so much as real time data that are collected at kind of, you know, you get the data like one to five minutes after, after it's happening. Um, and we're trying to um, kind of uh, ingest that data into numerical prediction models, weather prediction models that also forecast the position and intensity of, of wildfires called coupled fire atmosphere models. Um, and so I'm working on a, a project that's basically developing tools to do that. And the hope is that there'll be uh, better kind of situational awareness tools for uh, where a fire is at this moment and where it might be in 30 minutes or one hour from now. So not where it's going to be two days from now, um, but, you know, kind of short term uh, high impact predictions for uh, informing things like evacuation decisions and, and stuff like that. Um, so that, that's one effort that, that we have going on on my end. You want to add anything and about the research you're doing is it shared with land management agencies or um the you know fire management <laughs> agencies not yet i feel like i i'm such an academic right and i'm working really hard to be um, you know that's one of the reasons i'm here because i really want to say like um is this helpful like what we're what i can do is this is this something you care about like i can do this from satellite is that even a scale that is relevant? Um, like at the end of the snow season, I could map out where I think, you know, you're gonna have crispy forests and over periods of time, I can map out where those forests have gotten kind of overall browner. Is, but I can't really do it at this right now. I can't do it at a spatial scale finer than half a kilometer by half a kilometer grid cells. And maybe that's just not good enough. Maybe think, it's not good enough to make any, you know, decisions. I think that it would be interesting to incorporate the scale of the data that you're collecting and analyzing with some of the finer scale data or even the on the ground, you know, ground truth data that's being collected by field crews and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and especially on regional scales where, you know, like for example, our forest futures program and local stakeholders in on the Tahoe National Forest are trying to do a pretty large scale um, landscape level analysis of the rip, fire risk and and uh, forest health situation and and integrate multiple data sets to be able to prioritize areas for treatment. So it mm -hmm. sounds like some of the research that you're doing could I think could be useful in being incorporated into this regional scale of project prioritization that we're attempting to do. Um, because I think it's important to look at things from, you know, multiple scales of evaluation and, and bring in multiple modeling efforts um, to really create the most accurate picture that we can and as, as we're prioritizing projects and figuring out kind of, you know, where to fund projects first and where the highest risk areas are and then also incorporating, you know, where mm -hmm. the critical evacuation routes that we need to protect so that mm. if the fire is here and people need to get out, making sure that those areas stay 
as clear a fire as possible or open for evacuation. So I think it would be helpful to incorporate okay. your data with some of these other data sets. Um, and I, I'd be happy to connect you with some people that are working on those efforts as well. That would be great. And so the way I'm thinking about it now is I, I really, um, I feel very strongly about open source information for everyone. And so I use a tool called Google Earth Engine, which um, allows anybody to, to well, and, and I'm designing what I'm doing so that anybody can go onto it, this website that we're creating and look at, you know, and map out like, here's my area, right? Whether it's a polygon or a state or an eco region or a watershed or whatever it might be. Um, a decision-making management unit. Um, and then you can generate the output. You don't need me. You don't, you, I don't want to be the middle person here. I don't want people to have to have remote sensing expertise or big computers to download the entire MODIS NASA data set. I want information for everyone to be accessible through this cloud computing environment that I use, that I've used for a number of different projects now. And, um, and I, I find it really helpful. We use it with colleagues um, who are interested in mapping snow disappearance state um, anywhere in the Northern hemisphere or snow cover frequency anywhere in the Northern hemisphere, uh, actually globally, and you don't have to download any of the data. So right now I'm doing this for the, fire, the forest vulnerability um, these new metrics. So that's the plan. Um, but again, just because I can do it doesn't mean I should <laughs> and that anyone would want to use it. But if there's a way to collaborate, I would be thrilled to do that. So would my students. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, I'm going to turn to a couple of questions that are somewhat directed back towards Neil on the fire weather specifically. So um, going to combine these two since they're both related. One from Seth um, saying, we know fire behavior is becoming more intense at night, um, vapor pressure deficit related in many respects. What impact, if any, does that vapor pressure deficit in nighttime have with fire tornadoes? And is there a linkage between frequency and intensity of fire tornadoes at night versus daytime? And then um, kind of just follow up question on your research, Neil, and people trying to identify prescribed burn uh, safe weather windows, is your data being integrated into that as well? Yeah, both, both really good questions. And so yeah, the, the topic of the vapor pressure deficit is, is a really hot topic right now. And again, it's kind of how the fuels feel the climate impact is that's, that's kind of the mechanism, the demand for water uh, imposed by the atmosphere on the, the land surface and the fuels as the atmosphere gets hotter, uh, it gets thirstier and that water over land has to come from the land surface or often through uh, evapor evapotranspiration through, through the fuels and leads to that stress on the fuels and the drawdown in fuel moisture. So, you know, there's such an obvious and clear signature there. And, and one of the, the big signals that, that's seen is the nighttime warming, warming um, which means that nocturnal relative humidity recovery, where typically we expect it to get kind of moist near the surface overnight, just isn't happening in the same way. Um, and there's been a pretty clear signature um, in the lead up to most of the big uh, fires that have produced these fire, uh, fire generated tornadoes. Um, that that nocturnal warming in particular has been there in the you know days to weeks ahead of ahead of it, which is kind of setting that near term um, condition of the fuels maybe to, to tip the balance a little bit more in favor of these these explosive fires. So I think I think it's all uh, profoundly connected. It also leads to quicker growth of the fire the next morning. Um, so not just the nocturnal growth, but again, it kind of flips the switch on earlier in the day, the longer burn window, potential for kind of more rapid heat release. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's it's all intertwined, and and then that you know does get into the issue of windows for prescribed fire. Um, you know, I know it was an issue last spring um, on some of the prescribed fire experiments that we tried to go to. Uh, that they, um, you know, were planning 400 acres and got through five acres before the fire. You know, in 
may is too intense to meet the prescription objectives or to be controllable and you gotta gotta shut things down. And so identifying those windows um, is, is obviously critical, but perhaps is getting harder um, because because of the state of the fuels and because of these integrated weather and climate impacts on the fuels. So maybe, maybe if there's one, if there's one uh, nice thing about winters, maybe with low snow is maybe more, more winter burn windows. I don't know, I'm trying to reaching, reaching for silver linings here. Is there, and I don't know if this is something you've looked at, but if do prescribed burns in the, that occur in the winter have a negative effect on snowpack potentially? Is there any, have you done any studies on that? Have you heard of any studies on that? We haven't, that would be really interesting to do. I will say that anytime, anything that reduces the albedo of the snowpack and increases the incoming solar radiation melts snow earlier. Right. If there is smoke on snow, if there's any black carbon on, black carbon is really detrimental to snowpacks. Um, so anytime there's smoke on snow, um, yeah, you'll melt the snow earlier. It's kind of a catch-22 in that sense then. <laughs> um, great, let's see. I'm trying to see if there's, if there's a question that somebody's put in the chat and I missed, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, I think we've hit most of them and we've just got a couple of minutes left. Otherwise, I will go back to one that I kind of had loaded. Give everyone a minute. Okay, seeing no one unmute themselves, I'll go to um, a question that I have related to citizen science. And if either of you ever incorporate or if it would be helpful to incorporate any type of citizen science in the research that you do. Um, I Personally, I did some um, snow sampling collection at high elevations in the summertime last year to collect the um, pink snow, the bacteria that people are trying to monitor and track. And so just wondering if there would be any way that we on this call, you know, most of us not being um, to the level of academic that you guys are, but if there's a way we could help collect data and if Forest Futures could help that effort, just curious if you have any thoughts on that. I'll, I'll jump in. I'm, I'm one of the co-investigators on a project that was started in the Tahoe Basin called, originally it was called Tahoe Rain or Snow and that was a seed project. And we got uh, uh, more funding from NASA to create something called mountain rain or snow. I'll put the link in the chat in a second. Um, and it's really easy. You just sign up and you, uh, when there's precipitation falling out of the sky and you're up in the mountains or wherever you are, um, if you're in one of our mountain rain or snow regions, um, you just click rain, snow, or mixed, and boom, your fabulous data portal smartphone sends that information to the web app, uh, stores the location. Um, we really, really appreciate it. We have like a, more than a thousand contributors now. It's great. Um, and that is also helping us provide validation data for a NASA satellite that itself is trying to map whether it's raining or snowing or mixed precipitation falling out of the sky. Because that's kind of the first thing that has to happen for us to be able to measure snow on the ground. We got to have snow coming out of the sky. And honestly, we don't really have a good way of measuring that. It's remarkably crazy how hard it is to measure if it's rain or snow or mixed, aside from citizen science. So we would really appreciate that. I'll post the link in the chat in a minute. The other one is called um, Community Snow Observations, CSO. And that's another good one. If you love, if you're out and about, whether you're on a snowmobile or on skis or on snowshoes or snowboard or whatever, in the backcountry or wherever, and you've got your avalanche probe pole out there, we just ask that you, again, note the location using your smartphone because you've got the CSO app on your phone and you make three snow depth measurements and you upload that. I cannot tell you how much better that makes our snow models run just having depth measurements um, because we don't really measure depth all over the place. That's so mountain rain or snow and community snow observations are both great. And then the one that Nicole mentioned is called Living Snow, the Living Snow Project, 
which is really awesome. And that one also is through the Desert Research Institute. I'm not a, a party to that one, but my students um, in my snow hydrology course, when we go out in the field, we're going to be collecting samples for that project. So citizen science, yay, it's great. And it matters. It's not just fun, it matters. So thanks. Thanks for bringing that up, Nicole. I'll, I'll jump in on that too, because I think DRI and some of the efforts at, at UNR in general are kind of real leaders in, mm -hmm. in this stuff. And we uh, kind of modeled uh, a summertime effort off of the, the rain or snow sort of um, perspective. Uh, we're also collecting citizen science photographs of ash particles falling out of large wildfire plumes through a campaign called Ashfall. And uh, where you take your, your smartphone and you take a picture of the, the ash particles. And it's it's really, it's funny. It's like the same scientific issue of we don't, like I can see with a radar how much, like that there is material falling out of these plumes, um, but I don't know what it is. And I don't know how big it is and what the size and shape is. And so the same as we don't know from the radar necessarily if it's rain or snow, uh, it's really the same kind of problem. And getting these ground truth citizen science observations are, profoundly important and will over time, you know, science moves slowly, um, over time allow us to build models to actually predict what's what's coming out of these plumes, maybe where spot fires are more likely uh, to be occurring based on the size of the material suspended uh, in, inside of these wildfire plumes. So yeah, I, I posted a link to the Citizen Science Tahoe um, app, which you can do on the smartphone or, or on a computer as well there. Great. Thank you both for that one. It's always nice to kind of have a, an a call to action after these kinds of discussions where, you know, sometimes the outlook looks scary for our fire seasons and weather, but to, to have something that we can all participate in and, and help you with your research and with the, the data modeling is, is empowering. So thank you for that. And I'm going to turn it over to Kate because we're just about to run out of time here. One thank you quick, guys so much. One quick point though. I, yeah. do, I have to say people always say, Ann, you're a snow hydrologist. Why are you not like totally depressed over everything? <laughs> like, because there are solutions. We need to advocate for them. As individuals, we can change light bulbs. We can, you know, drive an electric car, car. But the biggest solution is call or write or otherwise communicate with your member of Congress and advocate for climate solution policies that's what matters awesome thank you both um this was a fascinating um discussion and we so appreciate you are joining us and and i love that you're not sure whether there's um any benefit to the work that you're doing in the larger scale i just see so much application and um i know that we are just you know so so grateful to the work that both of you are doing uh, you know, in the in this space, and and it really is inspiring uh, to know that there are things that we that we can do. There are measurements we can take. There are smarter decisions that we can make, and that your work is helping to inform our ability to do that. So thank you both. Thank you to Nicole for moderating, um, and thank you to everybody for joining us. I hope that you will join us again for our next salon, which will be Thursday, April twenty first. We're still working on finalizing the speakers and the topics. Um, but we know it's going to be another great conversation as tonight's was as well. Um, we also want to invite you to join us for a parallel kind of conversation um, with our Mountain Housing Council speaker series, which is also now looking at the intersection between um, housing and, and climate, the housing crisis that we have and the climate crisis that we're facing. Um, so that one is on Tuesday, March 8th from 12 to 1. It's a lunch and learn. Uh, so you can bring your bag lunch and sit at your desk and learn a little bit about uh, transitioning to affordable green housing to reduce carbon emissions and promote resource efficiency for our communities. That's a big mouthy title there. Um, uh, so we invite you to do that. There's a survey link in the chat. We hope that you will send your thoughts to us about what's important to you because that will help to inform our next decisions about where we go with this speaker series. We wanna make sure that it's really relevant and that we're talking about the things that you want us to be talking about and that you wanna learn about. So I hope to see you on April 21st. It's the day right before Earth Day, so that should be easy to remember. And thank you all again for joining us. Thank you, Anne and Neil, and have a good night.